Okay, you great. Need to, you need to indicate the. Uh, oh, okay, you got it. <clears throat> All right, I think we're recording now. So, once again, welcome everyone to the NASA Alumni League first Thursday program. Today is July 7th, 2022, and I'm Stokes McMillan, your friendly host who's been doing this thing for a few years now. And I'm excited to be having our first in-person gathering since the pandemic began. Now we're also Zooming today's presentation. So uh, bear with us, you guys online, uh, in case we have technical difficulties, but so far so good. But I'd like to welcome everybody here in the Guild Ruth and everyone online. So today our speaker is Mr. Matthew Peake, and he's the uh, archivist at the University of Houston, Clear Lake. So Matthew, graduated, uh, he, he's from Northeast Ohio. He graduated with a BA in history and minors in archeological studies and Near Eastern studies from Kentucky Christian University. He received a dual masters in American history and public history from Wright State University in Dayton, Ohio. He's a certified archivist through the Academy of Certified Archivists. And Matthew has worked in various positions with state historical society archives, county government archives, local historian societies, nonprofit associations, and other organizations since 20, 20, uh, 2005. He previously served as the founding corporate archivist for travel trailer manufacturer Airstream, one of our wonderful travel trailer companies. So Matthew worked from November 2014 to February 2022 as a military collection archivist for the State Archives of North Carolina. And he has researched and written various historical publications and programs from several historical societies. And Matthew, luckily for us, he began working as an associate director of the University of Houston Clear Lake University Archives and Special Collections on March 1st of this year. So he's the guy that you go to uh, here in, in, at JSC to have your, your stuff archived. So now let me, uh, let me get full share screen and I'll hand it over to Matthew. Okay, now Matthew P. Yep, thank you. Can you see me in the screen? We're good? Okay. Well, thank you for having me uh, four months in. This is, wasn't expecting me doing this this fast, but I'm glad you had me. Um, and sorry for the people online. You can probably see up my nose, uh, tried to trim, but sorry about that. <laughs> Anyways, so um, what I thought today, what we're going to do is uh, um, there's a lot of text in the piece. It's not intended for all of you in the room to read. I'm going to skip through some of it just to have it there as a reminder for myself. But this will be recorded online, so if you want to go back over it, you can see it. Um, and I didn't know the setup with the space, so we'll go from there. Mainly, the idea here is that I'm trying to provide NASA people specifically advice on working with NASA-specific stuff that you may have. So this isn't necessarily direct advice for your family papers from the 1880s, but some of the same principles apply. So I just want to get that out there. Okay. Let's see, where's the... It is not advancing. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to go over some assumptions and positions on my part. Since you all work for NASA, I'm specifically, like I said, um, discussing identifying and caring for your work materials generated during your time there. I'm also speaking in general terms about processes, and sometimes we'll make up names or work for example's sake. So please bear with me for that. Um, I'm still learning about the technical nomenclature. Um, I'm using my experience to generalize situations and collections. Every collection and situation is different. Uh, so always consult an archivist if you're planning to do something with your papers. You can never do high quality archival preservation at, at your family home. Um, I always have people try to buy the best boxes from the same places that archives purchase their boxes. And then it's in a house with no air conditioning with five cats. Um, you can, and you're just gonna waste the money. So um, it's about environment and stability and, and other things. And we'll talk about that. But uh, we're discussing the best options for at-home care. So your family, if you choose to keep the materials at home, 
was there and choose to have them come down the road to an archives, be able to do that. I'm not giving this presentation to convince you to donate to us at UHCL archives. I'm mainly trying to help you all out. Uh, we offer free consultations for this type of thing. I just want the papers preserved. That's all I care about. I'm a trained historian. That's my thing. So I'm going to read this quote because I thought it was really great from Michael Ashenfelder at the Library of Congress. Most of us comb through a lifelong collection of personal papers and photos, either when we have plenty of free time, typically in retirement, or when we have to deal with the belongings of a deceased loved one. All too often, the job seems so daunting and overwhelming that our natural response is to get discouraged and say, I don't know where to begin, or it's too much, I'll do it some other time, or worse, I'll just get rid of it all. And those are the three states that people find me in all the time. And you're not alone. Um, the hardest thing for people who are creators of their materials is to be able to disconnect themselves from the act of creation to recognize what is histor uh, worth retaining historically relevant. So you have a 1983 training manual from NASA. You're going through it, looking at it, thinking back to your department, the work you did, the people you work with on it, the processes. I'm looking at it, say I have five copies of that. That's the difference between what I can offer for you all and what you, you have to go through. And all these memories, emotions, former grudges and feuds, I've heard a lot of stories from people. Um, I'm a counselor for a lot of fan, uh, donors. Uh, frustrations over not finishing something or not doing it the way you want, these all come back when you start going through your papers. And that's why a lot of people push this off. So my rule, it's the 40 year rule. Um, this is a rule that a lot of archivists talk about. It takes people about 40 years from the time that they went to college, uh, graduated high school or got into their career to consider donating their papers. Time for their families, them to move around, have different careers, get through the process of their main work and have time to reflect on their, their experiences with their stuff. But let an archivist or curator help advise you um, because outside perspectives are invaluable when you're trying to make retention decisions. So what papers and historical materials you should keep? I wanna talk about different types of value. Uh, family papers have value to the family. Um, I'm going through this with a, a former NASA flight director's family right now, um, broader historical or research value and then monetary value. How do you separate those for each of the items or groups of items? How do you know what's historically relevant or has financial value? Um, every family is different. Every archives or museum is different in what they value or collect. And monetary value fluctuates. And when things get sold, or, um, it gets, they get damaged by the people who purchased it quite frequently. And they get separated from the creator who created the stuff and made it worthwhile or valuable to have. In archival work, we appraise records and only keep what has long-term value within our context. Um, so it'll be different for every person, but deciding what to discard, donate, give to others is an important part of the process. So I'm gonna share an example from the first place I started out with in North Canton, Ohio, with the Hoover Vacuum Cleaner Company. In 2007, they left this town they helped really found or build up from scratch. Uh, the company and the city were in, uh, in, in completely intertwined. And um, they started throwing out their materials, including all the historic materials that were stored in the factory. And there are two historical uh, communities in the small Ohio city between Akron and Canton, Ohio. The Hoover Historical Society, which is a house museum for the Hoover family who founded the company. And then the North Canton Heritage Society where I worked. And my former boss, Kathy Fernandez, was given the opportunity to go to Hoover to look at materials they found that were historic, photos, booklets, other things. And with the Hoover Historical Center, they split up the materials to go to the different institutions. About six months later, while they were pushing to get rid of the factory and clear it out, they threw away two boxes of oversized glass plate negatives from the 1910s and 20s showing all views of the historic city that we'd never seen before. They found it last, last minute. They didn't have time to bring it to our attention. They rushed it and they just pitched it. Well, a local resident saw them doing this, was curious, jumped in the bin, found it, brought it to the historical society. And we ended up getting a several thousand dollar grant to clean and have them digitized. And now they're available featured in local uh, community articles like this and exhibits at the local public library. So what different people value or their state, stage in life determines a lot of what gets saved, not the historical value of it. So 
So some de de definitions of archival terminology, so you're all on the same page. I'm going to go through this roughly. So in archives, what is an archives? There are a lot of different definitions. Essentially, we refer to it as, a, as an institution that preserves historic materials with an enduring value. Um, but archives, a lot of people use it to refer to their personal collections. So it kind of gets intermingled. An artifact, in my world, I call artifacts three-dimensional items, like a gun, a uniform, something that, a, a statue, something that is not two-dimensional paper-based that has self-contained information about it. It has to be interpreted. It's not a document. It's not a photograph. It's not a film. It's not a color slide. You have to do research to contextualize it. So arrangement. So for us, arrangement is organizing things based on use, creator, how someone originally stored or generated the stuff, uh, formats, other things like that, condition, size, so when I talk about arranging materials, that's what I'm going to be referencing. And enduring value seems to be the one that most people have the hardest time understanding. It's the usefulness or significance of records based on the information they contain that justifies their permanent or ongoing preservation, because it costs a lot of time and money to take care of this stuff long term. And we have to make decisions about it. And intrinsic value. So it's an archival term for those qualities or characteristics of permanently valuable records that make the records in their original physical form, the only acceptable form of that record. It's not a copy of the material that was produced 20 years later. It has a signature from John Glenn on his original flight plan mission rules, which I just saw the other day that went up for auction and got sold somewhere. Uh, because it has in itself unique value that doesn't have to be interpreted. It's all contained within itself. Original order. Um, so. I worked on a U.S. Senator's um, photo collection in, in Montana for the Montana Historical Society. And when we got his photo collections, they were donated over 20 years to different deposits. There was no order to them. And we, a lot of the photos were unidentified. So I talked to his former staffers and interns about how they stored the photographs in the office. And they shared that with me so I could return the photographs to the original order in which the Senator used them. And that matched how his papers were organized. So people could then find photos, then look for the same topic, his papers, and find papers that went with the photos. So when we're talking about original order, we're talking about the way you all store it. Um, I've come across military letters from Vietnam War tied up in bundles in reverse chronological order, how the wife of a soldier read them. And they hadn't been open, so I kept them in that order. You know, and then you, but you have to explain that to researchers because they're not, they don't understand how collections are arranged. So that's part of what I try to do is understand how you all stuff comes to me and are these groups of things connected? Are they not? And that's why splitting things up, giving it to multiple children can really damage the history of the materials because you can understand history about items and you all from how you group and store things or use them. Permanent record is a record that's worth keeping long term. I mean, birth certificates are usually considered that. Uh, financial records, if they have permanent retention for an organization, and preservation. So, a lot of people don't understand what preservation is. For us, it's the professional discipline of protecting materials, minimizing chemical and physical deterioration and damage to minimize the loss of information and extend the life of the property. All this stuff's going to go over the years. The hope is that people will use it, research it, reproduce it in other forms, books, documentaries that will last past the time of some of these materials. We just try to keep it from disappearing as long as possible to give as many people a chance to use it as possible. And then provenance, it's the ownership history. How did you get it? Um, I'm working on donation right now. The local historical society got a collection. It was in their building when they got there to own the building. They don't know where it came from. They don't have ownership of it. If they don't have ownership of it, then I can't make it available for the public for reproduction for documentaries or exhibits, or we can't put online because we don't know who owns it. So provenance is really important for us to get ownership rights to make things available to researchers. So what we're gonna do, I've got some scans of things. We're gonna go through some images of stuff that you all may have. And I'm gonna say what's important for us and what I think is important from the UHCL archives perspective and then what isn't? So I figure we'll start with the positive um, stuff. So the most common types of mat uh, materials that are important to keep or preserve, that archives keep. Uh, personal papers, your correspondence, records of your work history, your experiences. If we have your collection but don't have a resume, how can I write your bio? 
you with that, you know, you're because your work stuff is your work stuff. It's not about you and all the job titles. Then I got to go through all your papers to piece together your job titles and put them in chronology. And that takes a lot of time. So personnel records are really helpful. Uh, research records and notes that you did, awards and certificates, unframed. We'll talk about that later. Uh, work materials, notes, notebooks, calendars, schedules, memos, training manuals, booklets, um, photos, all formats of photos, moving images, uh, motion picture film, VHS tapes, um, digital movie files, posters, selected posters, um, selected published materials, rare books or booklets related to Johnson Space Center, history or some technical manuals, maps, art, any drawings, engineering, architectural or original schematics, um, other sorted paper documents, computer files, some born digital files for uh, more recent uh, NASA personnel, and then some small artifacts. So here's some examples of um, personal items, notebooks from NASA personnel. Um, both of these are from Paul Horseman, um, who worked with, um, he worked with space shuttle compartment uh, design in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. So he worked from 62 to 99 here, and he was with um, Langley before that. So these are his handwritten notebooks. We've got his meeting notes on the left with dates, times, names, project updates. And on the right is a sketch from after Apollo 11, where he uh, hand draws a pretty accurate drawing of what the new space shuttle is going to look like seven years before he actually starts in the development phase full-fledged, which I find really fascinating. And I've shown this um, the image on the right to a bunch of students and tour groups and museum studies classes. They get excited about seeing something. It has context because it's a graphic thing within a handwritten notebook. It's something people can connect with beyond the technical side of the work you all have done. Photographs, um, personal photographs or personal copies. We all know NASA official images are hugely significant. Why, as you can see here, um, well, why NASA has all their Mark Sparks is here can tell you. Sometimes it's hard to get photographs from the media because you have to have the image number. The photograph does not have the image number printed on it. And it does not have the description printed on the back like a lot of congressional photos do or military photos do or some of the photos that NASA produced that were issued to the press. This is not a press photo, but it was used for internal publications. So it's your personal copy and then maybe I'll be able to tie what this event is through that. So uh, having original period prints, even if they're they're copies, they're, but they're period copies. They're from the time that they were created. They're not 40 years later. They're during that period. Um, it provides context about what an individual did. Ne photos and negatives. I get this collection a lot. Do you want the negatives from my photo sleeves that I took to the pharmacy in 1982 and the prints? Well, a lot of archives want the negatives. I want the prints and the negatives because the prints oftentimes can be edited. The negatives are the originals, but negatives take a really long time to scan. And then you have to be really skilled to do color correction and match the original period color when you don't necessarily know it if the negative's gone through fading. So for me, the print is the period version of what it was, but the negative might have more information. So that's why just offer it to an archivist <laughs> or keep it. Personalized common or self-generated materials like operations manuals or Notebooks of KU band research on the right with stickers and lovely drawings when they were bored during meetings. Um, a lot of students really like these notebooks because they think, oh, they're just like me in my class. <laughs> they draw notes uh, and, and sketches. So the difference between keeping a copy of this manual without the name and one with the name is it's personalized. So if I have three copies of the same manual, I'm going to keep the one with the name on it. It's just it's so I can connect it to someone. A lot of what we do is about connecting to people and the uses. So uh, self-created work materials like this folder with a bunch of uh, stuff titled P and PL DNC nomenclature design guidelines. What the hell is this? <laughs> so I'm not, Zach, I don't, I need your help. We need your help define this. So I was able to look up in a NASA um, abbreviations guide, DC is design and construction, but there is no, explanation for what PL is, unless I find a period manual 
or period notebook in the person's papers explaining what this is. So if I don't have high-end science researchers doing the research, if I have students, grad students, trying to do a paper on this person or their work, without a definition, it's pointless and it's hard for them to understand. Um, so we need help from creators to know what projects they were involved in so I can easily define what this is in the descriptions of collections for researchers and help them find it. And then we have a calendar on the right with a bunch of notes from the meetings. Unique special event materials. This is the Paul 11 splashdown party invitation for Paul Horseman. It came with the invitation envelope, has his mailing address on it. Um, it's rare because there were only so many people invited to the event. Um, it has historical relevance. It's something the general public and students can connect to. Um, and even if there were 3,000 people at the event, I'd still keep it because even though there were 3,000, there'd be 3,000 of these. How many survived over the period since then? Probably a third. And then how many are going to come to an archives? And that's how I do the math in my head when I'm thinking about what to keep. Uh, but the event is still historically important, so we keep it. Period manuals that aren't reproductions and copies or later prints. So the one on the left, Apollo 13 CSM launch checklist, I know who owned this, I have the date, it has his notes inside. The other one's from a Gemini mid-program conference and it's local, has some notes in it, it's relevant. I'm using this cool example, final flight mission rules for Apollo 13. Um, so this is uh, Robert Hessemeyer's own rules manual. He recently donated this and finished updating his collection. Some of you know him, obviously. Um, and he was the lunar module flight controller for the Telmi unit um, for the Apollo 13 mission uh, while he was stationed in the Mission Control Center here at JSC. This way, I talked to uh, Bob about his stuff, and this is the actual manual he used in his group to solve the problem of how to power up the lunar module so they could handle uh, the support of the Apollo 13 crew members after the malfunction from the oxygen number two tank, uh, tank number two in the service module. There are other copies of this manual exists at the National Archives, but try finding it. Do you know how hard it is to find a single folder with one of these at the National Archives? Where a smaller archives, we can describe this, it's easier to locate. And the other thing is that Hesselmeyer, I don't know the accuracy of this, stated that there were four other people in his group who had this mission rules manual. I know of another one that we have from someone else, that's two. And so the other two are probably gone or in private hands or sold. So it makes this copy unique. It's tied to historic moment and it's connected to a specific individual. Other common manuals about a management manual for quality assurance, um, implementation procedure manuals, those are really great to have. Contractor materials, not promotional materials. Yeah, I do like this. I like the steel cage sausage shape protector for the lunar storm uh, protection. I think that's fun. Um, and so what I would do is I would scan this and show about how uh, concept designs for what um, protection in outer space would look like. Because I've seen some doozies, I'm sure all you have, about ideas of what would protect people in outer space. Um, and that's how I would connect with students in classes. Materials that are part of a set. So this one is a project outline for the maneuverable television project from July 1981. It has all the um, development photos with it. They are numbered, but they're together from one individual. It has some of his notes in it. It's part of a folder that he produced at the time. And so all that together is significant. If it was all separated, we wouldn't know necessarily all the connections between it. But what's great about this is its abbreviation is MTV. This came out, this reports the month before the television channel MTV launched. I had a, a volunteer note that to me um, and it was a younger person and they connected with that. So we, we get this one a lot, JSC Space News Roundup or the Roundup when it was that title issues. So we get offered a lot of these, we have, have a lot of these, um, many issues were produced. Many donors say that you probably don't want these or they give us multiple copies of the exact same issue. Um, or why we need 15 copies of one issue, I don't know. Um, JSC History Office and Mark Scrogans has con confirmed this to me about that they don't want them anymore really, right? Um, and they've digitized all of their issues and put online from 1961 to 2001, but there's no issues online after 2001. And so what we try to do is we are trying to collect in our human spaceflight collection, complete set of these as much as possible 
And we just processed a collection of these and we will continue to add. So that's an easy, fast reference for researchers to pull from instead of having to pull from a larger collection in the JS3 collection that we have, trying to locate that or send them to an online version. I had a intern for um, JSC history office come in and had seen all these in digital versions and heard about these art, uh, issues. And then I pulled the box out right there and she's like, oh, it's great to see and hold one finally. You never know the connection people have to materials. So bring them to the archives. We'll tell you if we need them or not. There are other places like Airstream where I founded their corporate archives because we did the mobile quarantine facility unit. I interviewed the only living guy who built it when I was there. They don't have issues of this. So I pulled recently two copies that had the um, Airstream featured on it or talking about the quarantine procedure for the Apollo 11 astronauts. I sent them two original copies because we had four duplicates of each issue. And now they have something they never had before from JSC. So it's the, it's the way that these things can be used. So what materials don't have enduring value or what archives won't usually collect? So this is from NASA headquarters archives on website. So I'm using this as a guide. This is in our collection policy. Artifacts, again, some artifacts, but wooden carved statues of eagles representing Paul 11 missions that weren't created during the time or by anybody involved in the project have no historical relevance to me as an archivist. Um, artwork. There's a lot of artwork. That's not an archive specialty. Autographs, how many are we can't, uh, authenticate autographs we don't know for sure they've even if you have them if they're on your stuff we can authenticate them but not collections of autographs archives get offered handbooks scrapbooks full of, of signatures all the time commercially published books magazines or newspapers they're not historically unique there's multiple copies around contractor promotional materials flyers those 15 copies of 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 uh, programs about their new design for some system we don't need that that's a promotional material it's not historical produced material that you, they use working with you all at NASA for development purposes. Models, we've got five models in the space shuttle, all different sizes, we don't need anymore. Um, we don't have a way to preserve them in an archives, that's a museum setting. Program, uh, programs of events in which NASA did not officially participate or sponsor. There's no relevance for our particular collections, might be for someone else. Publicly created scrapbooks, newspaper clippings type. For military stuff, this is really popular. Home front kids clipping out every newspaper article from World War II with no original letters, no original photos, no nothing. And our archives had all the newspapers that they clipped from on microfilm. I could just go and look at the original articles. And, then, and scrapbooks are really hard to preserve when they're just newspaper clipping like this. And space memorabilia, patches, pins, coins, medallions, awards, anything you get at an air show we don't need we have a lot of i was just offered another set of patches have them all we don't need any more and this is nasa's headquarters archives selling this so they're telling you this because they get off of this stuff so much and it takes away from the historic paper materials the photos the films the two-dimensional stuff that is really worth keeping and what researchers will actually come from california get on a plane fly to us to use HR and general workplace announcements. I have four folders of this in the collection I'm working on right now. Just random announcements and travel requisition memos. They're widely available. National Archives has them in JSC stuff. I don't need them. And it saves us space for storage. Manuals like glossaries or copy preparation manuals for writing technical publications. I have four copies of these. There's no history in the manuals. It's interesting to see how you all instructed at a certain time to produce them. Maybe it's a different year, but we're trying to keep a representative copy of this because there are other copies around. Also, I can look online on WorldCat, which is an international library catalog, and see how many of these copies are cataloged at libraries and available for reference or, or people can find. Or sp um, space transportation system and associated payloads, glossaries, acronyms, abbreviations. I have five copies of this. Um, some from different times, but I picked one in the best condition. NASA, JSC, public affairs, promotional materials, information folders. We get a lot of these. They're just glossy things that are hard to preserve because they're so glossy and plasticky. Um, they're filled with five copies of the same brochure. They're not produced by you. They're not used by you. They're, they're, they're just, they're not important to us. And then this card to the left, I'm sure you've all seen these. Um, from the flight integration office with the specs of all the space shuttles. I have 
three full sets of these. <laughs> They're widely available. What we don't have is um, the um, drawing booklets. We don't, show you. we don't have complete sets of those. But these were all given out at air shows. I know because I was one of those kids in Ohio at the Cleveland Air Show in 1995 who got these from the all Ohio crew around that time period. So children's materials and booklets. Um, there are places that will collect children's space materials, but this coloring book guide to the Soviet space, we don't need. Um, we're not having kids come up to color in it. There is no history to it. It's a representative piece, but when I'm weighing it about preserve, against preserving your, a folder of your 1975 research notes, I've got to make a decision, and this is not that important. Frames for framed items. For some reason, people think that uh, $10 frames they got at the local pharmacy have historical significance when a certificate is put inside of them. And what I want to tell you about this is frames and mats are not historically relevant. A lot of times people got them when they could to put something up on the wall. They're not expensive. They're not worthwhile to keep. They're bulky. The items within the frames are worth keeping. Framings for personal and public display. Items get damaged by light and the microenvironment of the frames that the glass creates. It will moisture in this climate. Water will build up inside the glass and it'll develop mildew. I can't tell you the number of things I've taken out of frames. And then you can't see the condition of the, of the documents around the edges where silverfish got in the frames and start eating around it. And then you take the things out and there's live silverfish in the frames because it's enclosed. So if you have these, it's fine. If I don't want to take your frame, I'm willing to take the certificates, but not the frames. That's the deal. Because the glass will break. And we're going to talk about this a little bit. I have student workers working on this stuff. I can't have them around broken glass. Cut your hand. I've cut my hand on really a strong 1919 glass from a World War I oval portrait that was a hand-painted frame of pine that someone made locally. And the glass broke and sliced my hand open. So we don't like glass. It's too heavy and it's just too bulky to save. Historic newspapers. Um, we have one whole collection of historic newspaper clippings that someone gave us. They're very acidic. They're printed on cheap brown paper, not meant to last, it's cheap to distribute. They're hard to preserve. They give off um, acid in the environment in which you store historic materials. My mom, when I was a kid, saved every newspaper, every historical event that she ever read, and she'd go buy two copies of the same thing um, at turn of the millennium, the Y2K issue, 9-11, what, um, whatever it may be, and then we moved out of our house and they threw all those newspapers away recently. We, we never used them. There are collectors for these, but these are not historical items, and most of the time the newspapers are microfilmed and available at libraries, archives, other places. But the originals are really big, they're hard to save, they get really brittle, they will break in researchers' hands, so you lose the information anyway. I'm gonna use an example, I'll speed this up a little bit. I'm gonna use an example here of the decision-making process I go through. I just had to do this with the collection. So the Apollo 15 lunar samples edited a book from the Lunar Science Institute, the uh, Lunar Planetary Institute here, it's short papers featuring numerous different scientific analysis of Apollo 15 moon rock and dust samples. It was produced locally uh, in Houston. It was published in 1972, a year after Apollo 15. It seems important, has a local connection. It's space history and manned space uh, flight related, but it's a hardback published book. Usually these are widely available unless it had a limited run or it was done for a very specific purpose internally for your organization, for NASA. So how to see if this is unique or worth offering their archives. So this is WorldCat, the library catalog. You can type in worldcat.org and search any publication. And these are only publications that are cataloged in library catalogs. A lot of archival materials are not. So what I do is I see how many are listed total of this book and how many libraries exist. If there's like less than 20, then it's probably more unique. I'll probably keep the copy. But if there's 150, there's enough copies out there, someone can get it on the interlibrary loan. I don't need to keep it in an archives. And again, I have to make a decision versus keeping five folders worth of historic photos that's the same thickness as this book or this book for the storage space. So I searched the catalog. There are seven editions of this book. This is a first edition, so that's a little interesting. Uh, but there's 101 libraries at least that have it, and then many of them are local to Houston, including the Lunar and Planetary Institute. So I'm not keeping this book. So what can you do to save your stuff? Or uh, please don't laminate or shrink wrap that rare photograph. 
That has happened more times than I care to say. So there are basically 10 agents of deterioration. You all know this, but I figure it's a good representation for you. Things that you have to worry about when deciding how and where to store your stuff. Physical forces, earthquakes, water damage, flooding, fire, uh, criminals and vandals. I had someone two weeks ago um, message me from a blog post I did at my former employer about a collection that our agency purchased online um, from our own funds because it was too valuable to let go. We don't usually purchase collections, but we did in this case. And the guy told me in an email that his house was broken into 25 years ago. And he doesn't think those things, slides were in that set. Uh, but even if they were, he's not wanting them back because he's glad that they're saved in an archive. And I wrote and described them and put the images online. So vandal stuff happens. Um, contam uh, contaminants, coffee on books. Um, I see a lot of coffee st mug stains on your historic records. That's, uh, uh, pests, light damage, incorrect temperature and incorrect humidity, and then disassociation from the context that who created them. And that's part of it. So there's a lot of text here. I'm going to skip through this. So some basic tips for home preservation. Common sense applies for preserving media, paper. Less is sometimes more. Move your papers to a stable environment if possible. A dark, stable temperature and humidity controlled environment where possible. I know it's harder in Houston. I've talked to some former NASA personnel who actually like no air conditioning. I, as someone who has no air conditioning in the car now for two weeks because it broke, I don't share that sentiment. Um, heat and humidity can cause paper to become brittle or moldy. And then an archives isn't gonna take in moldy paper usually. Light can cause fading or yellowing. Um, those storage units that claim they have controlled climate but aren't an inside unit uh, of a multi-level building, they're not kind of climate controlled. I just came from one this morning for a collection. Trust me, it was not a climate control. It's just inside of a, a lower level thing. Storage indoors is better than storage outdoors. Shed, garages, attics. I just picked up a huge collection from a garage and the materials were filled with cockroach waste. Um, that we have to then hand vacuum every single set of materials for about 60 boxes of items to get all of it off or else it's going to break out users' hands because of the pest damage. And there are people who do research or student workers who have breathing issues, asthma, that it will make problems. And then it will attract bugs into our storage area with all the clean stuff that we have. Um, Identify your stuff, group things together, describe the sets of materials and key items or materials, create typed or handwritten lists, and keep those lists with the individual boxes or on top of those items for your family, for people like me. It's really helpful. Uh, label your tapes, audio cassette tapes, films, digital discs, floppy disks, things like that. The discs that say fault error on it doesn't really help tell me what's in it to know if I should keep it or not or spend time trying to get the files off a 25 year old file. <laughs> And don't write descriptive information. Oh, don't use post-it notes or sticky notes. I know you all like to. I came from a, a person's house who had the actual post-it note plastic molded holder for his desk. So they're great for you all, but for us, they stick to things, they damage things that are sitting, and we have to pull them off, or then it has your notes. We have to copy each one of them. Some of these manuals have hundreds of these sticky notes, and then we just have to leave it, and then it'll fall off of where you put those notes. How do we take care of it? Don't write descriptive information on original paper documents and manuals now. Leave your notes on those items. Don't use pen if you're gonna do it also. Because of the way I date things and originality is looking at writing on there. I can date by the ink style, the handwriting style, the way it's aged. I can tell if it's original versus a fake or that someone added notes in more recent times. And that's a lot of, that makes, uh, tells me a lot about whether I should take it in or not. You don't generally need to purchase specialty boxer folders. They're available if you want. Just make sure the boxes are sturdy and won't break because broken boxes allow pests and water to get in. Um, box down at the bottom in our slide, it's a flat box for newspapers. Each one of these boxes is $65. You can only fit about 10 to 15 issues of a newspaper depending on size per box. So if you give me a collection of 200 historic newspapers, do the math. We, we are not wealthy people. So um, paper materials are best stored flat, horizontal or vertical, either store in piles and cabinet or desk stores flat or upright in boxes on edge without sagging. 
uh, regular wet record center boxes or bankers boxes are okay, but cheaper ones break. Um, and so when your family's moving them, handles break, they're not going to replace them. Then you have broken handles and then you're going to drop it. Then the stuff's going to spill out all over the driveway. That happened two weeks ago to me. Um, paper materials fare better than photos, films, or mixed media in temperature and humidity fluctuations. So at the left is a box from a collection I picked up where binders and papers are bent. And these papers will stay bent like this. There's no quick solve to unbend them. Um, and then when I try to put them in folders in archival boxes and store them upright, they're gonna resist and it's gonna create issues in storage. Um, and then the boxes at right are an example of some of the stuff is not completely straight up and down, but it's there's enough in the box to keep everything flat together. And that's pretty decent. Plastic binders are not the solution. My God, you people like them. Plastic binders. It is unbelievable how many plastic binders I've had to remove from collections. Um, materials inside, they bend in the bottom if you store them on the end. And if you store them the other way, they pull off from the three ring metal binders. And then you have loose pages if they're not numbered. What can we do? Um, they get stuck in that shape, like with the boxes. The metal rings rust on the items. Also, inside of these binders, pests really like to hide in the binders. I can, with that garage collection I just picked up. A lot of pests inside binders, uh, and then we have to get rid of them. Just, yeah. They're meant as temporary solutions, not long-term storage options. Don't store your photographs in plastic sleeves or binders you can get from the store. Walmart, Michael's, Target, local craft stores, if they say are acid-free, that they're acid-free materials, they're not truly acid-free because these items have to be produced in a specific way, and there's only so many companies that do that. Don't feel like you need to do people a favor by organizing your materials in an album. I just came from a place three weeks ago, local organization that wanted to organize all their photos in a photo album for me first, which would take about four months for them to do, because there was a lot. And I said, I'm just gonna take all the photos out of the album anyways and store them in archival plastic acid-free sleeves. So I'll just give them to me as they are. I'll take care of them for you. Um, basically keep materials created for the same event, program or at the same time together by format or keep things together by format in general um, or purpose. Papers with papers, photos with photos and slides, training manuals with handbooks. If you have the newspapers stuck to photos, newspapers are really acidic, photos are damaged really easy by acid, then you'll have an imprint of a, a 1969 newspaper on the surface of a 1969 photograph. And you can read what the newspaper was on the photograph. So. So uh, protect from agents of deterioration, uh, chemicals, pests, sun and rain. So don't spray insecticides around materials. I've had people, oh, I'll go and fumigate the garage where I have my stuff. No, because then that spray's going to get all over it. No researcher could be able to handle it. It's going to break them out. Um, don't leave windows open uh, so the sunlight shines directly on your framed items or piles of papers in your office. Move your boxes around every so often. Just shake them up a little bit so bugs don't like get used to stillness. Um, and then try to keep your boxes of papers off the floor in case of flooding. I know this stuff is harder than I'm making it sound. Uh, frame materials will get damaged by light, like I said. Um, you can store these items out of the frames if you decide or your family decides they want to keep them and save them in larger flat box if available uh, or just store it out of direct sunlight. Um, and update the frame and map regularly or else the stuff will get stuck to it. At left is a book with silverfish damage. I will not take that in. No one's going to be able to use it, and it's just going to fall apart. At right is a box from the collection in the garage that is full of that. those little pellets at the bottom of the box are from cockroaches. Last one, don't store magnetic audio video tapes or mag, uh, magnetic digital media next to magnets. It happens a lot more than you want to know. Heating sources, space heaters, vents next to the windowsill water heater because the heat will mess with the magnetism. Fortunately, the scientists in the room will understand what I'm talking about. So um, open windows uh, because the humidity fluctuations will damage the magnetic media and uh, heavy moisture areas. Um, if it's a floppy disk, it will the moisture will build up on the thing and, and cause uh, rusting in some cases. Uh, take active steps to import your digital files. Um, they're not going to last forever. Transfer your files from old media to the new media, uh, know where it came from. So say transferred from 90, 1996 floppy disk 10A, if you had that numbering system. And then uh, create consistent file names for your digital files based on the content uh, instead of the default photo number that you have when you transport a photo from your camera. 
Um, you need you should be able to guess what the file is without having to open it. Okay, one other one. Sorry. So I'm going to explain the explain your your work and your projects in layman's terms. How else are your children or someone else like me going to know what a manual for the SLAP programming language guidelines for global orbiting data systems is? And I had to look up at SpaceLink ARQ procedures. I always love a definition with an abbrevi of an abbreviation with an abbreviation in it. Uh, an ARQ is automatic repeat request technology. I have no idea what that is. And if the purpose of an item or set of items isn't known or understood, it's not going to be seen as worth preserving. How do you make a decision on something you don't understand? So if you des describe what projects you worked on and you worked on this project, then I know it's important to keep because you worked on this project. So, you know, write a little thing about what you've done. I'm going to skip over this. So that's my contact information. I'll say so at um, UHCL archives, we have three collecting areas, university archives, um, human spaceflight collection, which is materials from Johnson Space Center personnel or related to human spaceflight in, in general. Uh, but we prefer we prefer personnel papers from JSC or materials produced at JSC and then uh, Clear Lake area collections. So materials that you all may have may be relevant to us. It, you may want to donate it to your alma mater university, and I can help you with that. It doesn't, again, it doesn't have to come to us, but it will be in good company with other collections that people will be able to reference uh, similarly. So, and that's all I got. Any questions? Thanks for bearing with me. Thank you, Matthew. Tell you what, since we've got folks here and folks online. Let's, so why don't we do questions in this room first? And then after we get some of those, then we'll take questions from online. Yeah. Any document that has a mass of official number, you probably have that document already. Yeah, so the, the comment was any document that a NASA document that has an official number would probably already have. We may, but that's in the Johnson Space Center history collection. That's not in our human space flight collection. The National Archives and NASA own those collections. I can only provide reference. The purpose of us having a human spaceflight collection as a collecting area for the archives is to have personal materials, personal materials from you all that is not owned by NASA that we may have to send back to them for storage. So yes, it may be we may already have, but it's about where it, which collection it's in. I might repeat the question. Yeah, that I, I did right front. Yeah. Any, yeah. Kathleen, you mentioned um, that you found something in a box of documents. Yeah. Yeah. And so you could not release that information or photocopy it if it was online. Yeah. And the question I would have is there a date that, you know, based on how old that is? Yeah. So I think that kind of archivists are going to, you know, allow for that. Eventually, to occur, if you look at and cover books, yeah. I mean, they do it then. I don't know how long you have to wait. Yeah. But what is the rule of thumb on, on things like that? Well, I'll say the Egyptians didn't have record laws and copyright yeah. laws. Um, so the question was basically I made a comment about a box of materials with unidentified uh, creator ownership and how long would we have to wait to be able to make those available. So that was a generalization. There's a lot of technical stuff and legal rights things. I'm not a lawyer, but I've dealt with this a lot. Essentially, we can make it available as a public institution. We have public archives, a state archives, a public university, a, a public historical society, county historical society, state historical society. You can make those available for research and for reference, but we can't, I mean, we can put them online. We could put this items restricted for use. We don't own the copyright to this, but let's be realistic. If we put something online, people are gonna use it without permission. That's the world we live in. And also with materials like that, they're less likely to be used by researchers looking to use them for documentaries. Before I came here, I was working with um, PBS on a documentary piece. And, um, oh, what's the, it's not who do you think you are, the other, um, Ancestry Roots television show blanking on, but I was helping consult with them and we didn't have ownership rights to a photo. So they are not going to spend the time doing the research to find the descendants of that person to get permission. And they're not going to use the photo because we don't have the rights to the photo. So a lot about the rights is about making decisions on what researchers are going to use. That's why we asked for in deeds of gifts, if you own the rights to the materials, 
copyright to it, give it to us so we can make it freely available for people to use for whatever purpose they want. There are copyright laws. So some things are different. Confidential laws or uh, like with NASA materials, a little bit more tricky under ITAR regulations as Mark and I know. Um, I get told about, oh, you can't put that online because of ITAR. I can't put that photograph of a spacesuit for 1975 online. Um, so some of it is opinion-based. Um, but essentially what I'm trying to do when we take in collections is if we're going to spend the time to organize it, describe it, spend money to house it and store it and have our AC temperature control it, we want to make sure that we can make it as widely available for use as possible. So if your family ended up splitting up your papers, for instance, and then didn't keep notes about who created it, and then the family, something happened to the family, the house went up for auction, Another owner came in, didn't know where who owned everything for sure, uh, knew that these people had it, but didn't know if they had the rights from the original owner, even if they were family because of different family stuff. They might sell it or they might try to donate it to an archives, but without the provenance of that stuff, to know that you're the next in line or the person who has permission to give it to someplace, we're not going to own the right that we might own the custody rights, the physical rights, but not the intellectual rights. And those are complicated distinctions with archive stuff. Yeah, in the back. I'm curious on your thoughts of how archiving is changing, but moving into electronic media, even historic art uh, yeah. photos that are uh, that I have, like the hollow uh, astronaut training of white, yeah. that are now on a thumb drive. Yeah. How is that changing since it's moving out of a tactile product to an electronic product? Yeah, so the question was how archives are changing dealing with uh, born digital or digitized materials that people have versus originals. Uh, complicated. So uh, I can tell that my, I, I have worked at a place that had not, it was a state institution that had not had a digital repository to store born digital records from state agencies for 20 years from the start of digital file creation. So that means they lost time in getting those records saved. The reality is, we're not IT people. And really you have to be really technically able to solve problems with file issues and converting to different systems, but also space. The file space is so big. Universities, a lot of them don't wanna give space up for storage because they don't understand it. Most archives will not take items that are scanned by people, given to them on media, like a thumb drive or something from an original because they're scanned at different settings, maybe not archival preservation settings, and then we've got to use our storage space to store low resolution scans that if a researcher needs a 20 by 24 blow up of a photo for an exhibit panel from your 150 DPI scan of your 1963 photograph, it's not going to work. So why are we keeping it? These are the decisions that we have to go through. And if there's no descriptions for all these files, if I have a flash drive right now that has 15,000 files on it. I don't have a, there's no system to review the content. It's the, that's why file naming is important. The contents of the materials is not what it says the materials are. And unlike images, I could just go through and look at them and decide by content what it is. I can't do that for digital files. So honestly, digital files get left to the side. We have a box from the guy who worked on the Mars spacesuit stuff, and we have all a zip disk. Well, we just recently got a zip disk reader, but then we have to do a conversion for the software, for the system, for the files it was an apple-based program to convert the files to our windows program and then see if we can store the data so and then it's more recent stuff it's going to be under itar because we're still trying to go to mars um, so there's no good solutions for digital materials the solution is you scan stuff for you for your record so you can share with your family but don't get rid of the originals what i tell people is keep the originals Scan it for yourself if you want, and then give it. Also, archives were not your um, Walgreens digital storage warehouse. You don't donate it to us and then ask us, can you give us 10,000 of those items scanned? Because we'd like cop. Don't give it to a place and expect them to scan everything because not everything you have is worth scanning and storing. That's why you have the physical copy. <laughs> and that's why you spend so much time to preserve it. We're moving into an era where we've got to learn to deal with born digital. I studied digital curation in grad school. It's just... When you're in a bigger institution, there's too many hands involved and you've got to deal with an IT department that doesn't understand history and archives and and it's it's complicated. So I don't know if that really answered that. Yeah, Mark. Yeah, related to that, and before you throw something at me, how do you handle emails? 
So the question was, how do we handle email? So I'll tell you at my university under the uh, University of Houston Systems Record Detention Schedule, emails are historic records. We have no digital repository. We have no email retention system. My last place at State Archives in North Carolina was one of the uh, institutions nationwide that uh, pioneered the email archiving program. And so they were using it so it's fully searchable. They just get ingested automatically through Microsoft 365 uh, Outlook. Um, they get automatically ingested and, and managed. And then ones that aren't to be kept for retention get left let go. Those that are supposed to go through a system, they have a redaction system. But you have personal confidential emails. I have interns emailing me resumes with their, um, with their social security numbers on it or their, um, their transcripts, college transcripts. And at my last place, those were public records. The idea is that no one's really going to come look for those. It's really the big public official that people look for. Um, in Dayton, Ohio, Montgomery County Sheriff had an issue with race relations, and the local paper wanted 50,000 emails from the Sheriff's Department in nine days from the county archives with a staff of five people. There is no way, because they have to redact it you know, for confidential information under federal and state laws. So the laws slow down and the limited work staff slow down the efforts to and the willingness to let people from the decision makers to save email and the systems to do it, it takes up a lot of space email is just going to be one of the, it's like letters you know people burnt their letters from world war ii women a lot of time in north carolina burnt their letters because they thought they were um, personal information two censors read those letters during world war ii it's not personal information it's personal to you but other people have already read the letters um, or else you wouldn't have put in a letter that censors could read. So, but they're burning those letters, so we're losing those letters. The same thing is happening with email in a different sense. So, uh, there's, we don't have a solution. I've been trying to push for solutions locally, but I mean, you can export your emails as PDFs. You can go to folders, export the whole folder. So I have the folder title, I have all the emails in chronological order, save them as PDFs, but it can take like three hours if you have a thousand emails in a folder. And then I'm willing to take in those PDF files of your email if they're labeled properly. So there are options. Just dealing with digital files takes us all the time. That's why I haven't named or numbered any of my 25,000 photographs I've taken over the past 12 years as amateur photographer. <laughs> so, yeah. What about? Hardware from space vehicles. Yeah. For example, tiles from the space shuttle. You actually flown yeah. hardware. So hard. The question was, what about hardware from space uh, space missions, shuttles? So those are artifacts, and they're composed of different materials that an archives is. We, we're can, uh, able to deal with paper, with plastic, film, with um, with different mixed media like that. We're not ready to deal with asbestos based materials from the '60s with uh, metal things that rust or need special storage environments because they all have different storage needs and box types and conservators to treat those materials. And I'm not that person. Now, I've, I've done it, but I'm not that person. So there are museums to, to send it to. And there are a lot of museums that would take it in. But I would say there was a time when anything from NASA was gold for our museums or historical societies. Because I'd be there and people would come in, oh, this is a cool thing. And this, you know, we'll take this one thing in. It's really cool. It has no connection to the community no one who used it or flew with it lived in the community but they took it and because of changes in culture and society recently there are changes in app in session pol acquisition policies and what we collect and the focus is more on is this going to have an impact is it culturally relevant not is this cool because it was on the space shuttle um, so that's where we allow nasa's own internal systems to do it uh, the national museum of Bear and space to collect. I used to know the former director years back in grad school. Um, we let them deal with the national wide significance. They'll get the big stuff. If you have personal items, we might take it in. That's why I said small artifacts. We'll consider it based on item by item basis. Um, but it depends on what it is. So yeah, uh, the, the Apollo 16 matchbooks uh, that have live matches in them, I don't need them in a room full of papers that can go up in flames. <laughs> and I just found them in a box recently for a collection of process. And I'm like, why did they take this in? Because um, they're not safety matches. So, you know, then I have to find a way to discard them safely, douse them in water, throw them out in the trash. Yeah, so not everything's historic, even though it's old. <laughs> yeah, question back. I brought my collection over there, but 
before the lockdown. Yeah. Uh, several years before, and, and I had to sign a release. Yeah. So what did I sign? <laughs> it's, you, signed, you signed a deed of gift. So a deed of gift is the document that transfers all legal and intellectual property rights to your to the materials you own. Now you may not own all the intellectual copyrights. You may have a booklet that was produced by Mobile Oil in 1980. It's still under federal copyright. It has a copyright symbol. But you transfer the ownership rights that you have to the materials, the physical and the intellectual that of what you produce, so that we can then promote and describe and make it available to people. And then we have no limitations on what students can use it for documentaries, YouTube film, films that they shoot for classes, exhibits in our art gallery, whatever it may be. When there's restrictions, that's when there's fewer uses. So there's fewer chances the collections are going to get used. That's kind of the decisions the archives make nowadays, but we still have it. We may not have gotten to processing yet because there was no associate director since oh, June. This, oh, okay. So there. Okay. So there you go. So it's, it's done. So, yeah. Any other? So what about uh, like 16 millimeter movie film that's deteriorating yeah. and what to do with something like that? So the question was, what about 16 millimeter film? I'm glad you asked that. That might be deteriorating. At my last job, I had a, a, a lovely woman who, who took her spouse, late spouse's uh, World War II eight, mil, uh, eight millimeter films that he shot by hand to a Walgreens where a person getting paid 850 an hour developed, uh, digitized the film on a digitization machine and completely ripped the film up. It just cost her $30. It was great. <laughs> but speed and quickness doesn't mean what's best for the materials. So, I mean, we take those, we take films in. Now we can, we can, I, I'm trained in it. I specialized in a U.S. Center's film collection, so I can do cleaning. We don't have all the equipment to unwind it, rewind it. But we can have the equipment to clean it. Um, we can rehouse it in cans. We can core the film. We can store it to prevent it. We can get grants and digitize. Everybody loves film, so it's easy to get done. If it's Texas specific, where you produced it here at JSC, um, there's the Texas Archive of Moving Images. Is that the right time, Mark? I'm blank. And a version of that, they have a website. They partner with groups where we provide films from our collections. They pay the cost to digitize it and they put it online on their website. So if it's Texas specific, we could do that. There are film preservation grants. So if the stuff is connected from one person, if I got six of them, I can get a grant most likely. Um, and we can send them out to be digitized, cleaned, and then we can make them available. So digitization is the best option, but that person who has the digitization center set up in their basement at their house, and again, has five cats. The stuff's not going to be preserved because cat hair is going to be getting on the film, rubbing against the emulsion on the surface of the film, and causing damage. And it sounds like that's not a big deal, but I've worked with collections like that where someone has touched every single piece of a film with their fingers 40 years ago. And now I'm looking at finger marks, fingerprints all through the emulsion of the film. So, and then people like it, people use it, but documentarians are less likely to use it because there's fingerprints throughout the film, unless it's a Neil Armstrong, you know, unless it's a really significant film. So yeah, I mean, the best option is to clean it, um, to core it. Um, cans are pretty inexpensive, good cans, um, and store it, and then label it. Um, the worst thing with films is having huge film collections of all those 1950s, 60s travel things you did with your kids or with your parents that we get offered a million of um, that, have no historical relevance. And the 5,000 slides that they showed their family at picnic dinners on July 4th um, from the 1960s, you know, um, those don't have a lot of relevance. So if I need to know what the film is, because otherwise I gotta spend a lot of time because of the size, the, the medium of the film, it takes a lot of time to go through a lot of reels of film. And it just, it's time, so. And, and should the film after it's been digitized be Kept. Yes, the film, after you digitize film, it'll keep the original. Always keep the original. Um, unless you decide you don't want to donate your paper somewhere, you need to get rid of space. And if you're never intending to give it to anyone and you have kids who want it, then I can't tell you not to get rid of it. You've scanned it, you felt it safe. But then what's the point of scanning it to keep it if you have no one to give it to? So, I mean, these are, these are appraisal decisions you all can make when you look at your own stuff. Uh, yep. I hear people advertise uh, Ancestry.com. Yeah. Is Ancestry.com or some other service a good place to send stuff? 
Uh, yeah, so the question was about places like Ancestry.com or there's a, a, a like um, there's a photo box company that send us your box of photos and we'll scan them all. They will scan them all. And they'll, but what they'll do is they'll clean them all up. They'll make them look nice as new. They'll do, what I do as a historian is I try to save and preserve the material, I'll digitize the stuff and preserve the condition of the materials while I'm doing it. These companies have to go through a lot of these really quickly with people who aren't trained as historians or archivists and they're just handling film. And the idea is once it's scanned, they don't need to keep the originals. And a lot of these companies will actually mark, do you want us to discard the originals? Also, some of these companies have things that if, if you digitize it, do you give them the right to sell the originals? So watch the fine print. Um, these box things are really nice and they're helpful to you. And if you want to do that, that's up to you. What I tell people, what you do with the stuff before it comes to me is up to you. But then I have to deal with the physical condition of what those other people did to it once it comes to me. So that's why it's better to make a decision sooner to get stuff to an archive than later. We might not organize your collection for three or four years. I've been at places a collection sat not being able to organize for you know, 20 years because there's a thousand collections to work on that comprise about 10,000 feet of materials. And it takes time to go through the process, but it's in a safe place, it's stored, and you can still get access to it. And that's the important thing. Yeah. Are there any of those companies that do that that you do recommend? I personally cannot recommend those companies as an archivist um, because it would show preferential treatment to one company. And what I, I, I'm only allowed to deal with historical value and intrinsic value. I, I can give you places that are great or vendors. I can't select a vendor because I'm a state employee. So I am not allowed as a state employee to make those kinds of decisions for you. What I can do is I can give you a, a list of places and the options and here's cost, here's what they do. Um, I can do that with film reels. There are very few companies that deal with film, uh, but the companies that we use for digitizing film work with individuals. Um, they digitize their own films, but some of the downsides of that is a lot of those companies like volume because they make more money from it and it, it takes time. And if you send one film, they're less likely to put it, get it done quicker because they've got all these other projects with bigger sets of films. So just be aware of, of that type of work. But I'm, I don't, I would like to, yeah. okay, yeah, I, I have to go compile, I don't have it ready, so, but I could compile it and we could make it available. I can just, I wouldn't send it to these mail-in companies that you don't know physically necessarily where they are. You don't know who the technicians are that would be working on your stuff. Because if you don't have a list of all the materials that you're sending out, you don't know what's been kept or what's been damaged or what's been, and that's the difference between our archives and, and a for-profit company. Yeah. You mentioned cleaning a few times. Yeah. Can you give us a couple of examples of what you mean? How you clean and what you clean? Yeah, so, I mean, if I used, if I was working with 60 millimeter film, there are specific uh, film cleaning solvents uh, that are safe for film. Uh, there's like three companies that sell, uh, sell it. It's a little expensive for the can, get um, white fab cotton fabric sheets. I have to have a rewinder to roll and unroll the film. I have to have a split reel so I can open up the reel, put the new uptake uh, film on with the core uh, to get it off of those metal reels that are rusting. Then I will take the rag, wind it slowly with equal pressure, the film through the rag to clean it off, then rewind and the, to get it on to a take up reel, then rewind it back on the floor. Put the, surface residue yeah, move, moving surface residue, but you have to be trained in that because if you do it with that, if you put too much pressure, you're gonna wipe all that stuff, the dirt and grime, oil from the film reel, motion picture projectors into the stuff. So I wouldn't suggest doing it yourself. I've seen people get uh, air canisters and try blowing dust off of uh, glass plate negatives from the 1890s. It also blows off the emulsion <laughs> off of the glass plate negatives. So that's why I say common sense stuff is, you know, I wouldn't just because something gets advertised as being safe. Again, it's like Walmart selling photo uh, sleeves saying they're acid free. They were made in China by a company that used really acidic, cheap plastic. And then I see those photos stuck to that plastic when I get them from people like you. And I try to take the photos out and the emulsion rips off and I can't do anything with it. So um, there's that you have to go through professionals and there are companies that will clean stuff for you. But again, this field of specialty for companies compared to what it was in the 80s, 90s has really dwindled because there are fewer people working with these formats now. So that's why archives are the best option. Um, if this was in the 90s, there'd be plenty of people who you could send it to films because people were still using film reels back then. 
So if, if somebody has a like a 16 long yeah. film gets it restored, yeah. times, is there an opportunity for the original owner to be able to get the, the physical media back? Or does it automatically kind of go over? No, I mean, once you sign the paperwork to donate it, we, we yeah, I mean, we're not going to give you back the stuff that you signed because that's, we, we got grant money. We got, mm -hmm. there's legal tie-ins so that if, if you digitized it, you own the physical cop because the digital is not the master. It's the, it's the accessible version of the original. Yeah. And then you try to preserve the original as best as possible. But the, then the original owner could get a copy. You could get a digital copy. Yeah, that's pretty common. Or we put it online and you can share it. So that's, uh, I'll let it go there. Hey, it, yeah, so let's uh, let's cut off questions here for a little bit. Let, let's see if anyone in the Zoom uh, has questions. So any questions from you okay, Zoomers? Let's, see. let's go ahead and, and mute yours and I'll let it be okay. mine so we can use this hopefully. It's supposed to have a speaker on it. Okay, did you want to send any questions from uh, the, from uh, your online community? Okay, and everyone on you, they're on? Yeah. Okay. How many are online? About 20. It's about 15. And, and you, you can all you can always get in touch with me and, and I, can I can help, help you with stuff, stuff or I can, I can come, come out we do stuff with called donor site visits. visits. I'll come, come out to where you're at and meet somewhere where they'll get your stuff and give you advice. advice. Um yeah. Well, sorry, 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 we don't have any questions from online. Yeah, in the back. So what what's your relationship with Jesse History Office coordination? It's a good question. So under the Space Act agreement that we signed, to, uh, that's renewed every, years, um, uh, renewed every 10 years. Renewed every 10 years. Because we have the Johnson Space Center History Collection on loan from NASA and the National Archives. Um, um, Mark Scrogan is our official reviewer uh, from uh, NASA JC Archivist. He is our official reviewer of materials that we get from you. So if there are things that I think are confidential, ITAR-based, our technical drawings, scientific, scientific things. things. We kind of have kind a rule from like 1980 to 85. Like the cutoff weight of, weight of stuff, stuff is too new technology, technology could still kind of be used, generally speaking. But, but otherwise, um, we would consult Mark and say, if we're not sure, sure have him come over, over a take, take a look, look get us in touch with someone who can review materials. materials. I mean, that, I mean, that, it, it, it sounds, sounds faster than this. Is. Um, I'm trying to get people interested in looking over that stuff. But um, so we work with them. Um, they come over, do research all the time. Um, Jennifer over at JC, the historian, comes over, does research. Um, we help make things available to researchers who they forward to us, or we help, help get stuff to them. We scan stuff for them sometimes. They scan stuff for us. Um, so yeah, it's a working partnership um, because um, we have their historic materials. But I, I tell people this too, the stuff we have is a compiled collection. Right, it's stuff that was compiled by JSC and NASA and from contractors on papers. It's not always the original stuff that was used in mission control or a given office. That stuff's already at NARA or has been digitized. We have collections of period copies, so they're original to the time, but they're not the actual copy that was used in the space that people were working. Uh, yeah, no, so I mean. <laughs> The collection's great, it's useful, but there are other avenues to locate that information. So we work with Mark for researchers to, to see, hey, do you have these things? <laughs> we don't have these things. Right, would these be at NARA? And, that, and to let them know, okay, they're looking for the original version of this. We need to send them to, to there. So yeah, we partner all, but I've been in touch with you like three times the past month. And the advantage to the CL collection over there is the yeah. Mark Scrogan's comment was that it's easier to use stuff at UHCL archives than the National Archives. So the National Archives organize stuff because it's government records. They organize stuff by series and subseries, depending on the creating office of the person. So all of the US Army records from World War II to yeah. Vietnam are in one series. So then you have to go to the specific Army division to look up their records and then go to the boxes or the formats of records for a specific time period that covers the World War II period to locate that division's records 
for World War II. And there might be 50 boxes, there might be one box. You don't know because they don't process to that level. Our stuff is processed to file a folder level because JSC did that years ago. And um, it's easier to access and it's closer. So, yeah. Yeah. Where does your budget come from? How much university? How much NASA? <laughs> Uh, NASA does not pay us for any of the work. We do not process a JSC history collection materials. We manage it. We provide reference access to it under the agreement uh, because it also brings significance to our institutions because have been, been founded for you all. <laughs> um, our budget is, is through our library budget. We don't have a specific archives operate budget. Um, that's why we're trying to do fundraising options. And the endowment you all have done for interns helps us out to be able to have people to help with processing collections. Um, but yeah, we, I have been hired to try to be smarter about what we do so we can make the most of what we have. That's what I've been hired to do, if that answers it. Yeah. You're interested not only in space, but everything. It, so what we're interested in is if you, if we're getting your papers, we don't just want your papers from your time at JSC or NASA. If you have personal papers, we'll take your personal stuff with it too, as long as the majority of the collection relates to your time at NASA. If 75% if of your collection is personal stuff, business records when you weren't at NASA and then you have some NASA stuff, maybe the collection is better at your alma mater, your university, uh, because they take alumni papers. Um, it's there's a complicated decision-making process to knowing where collections fit. So I'm more than happy to help advise you. I've done this at a lot of, this is my fifth state. <laughs> I've advised a lot of people on this type of thing. Um, but we want as much materials as possible to help give people as complete a picture of you, a specific project, if, it's, if you only have papers on a project, because they're gonna ask about you all. You know, look at the films that are being done about NASA and Apollo missions currently in the popular media by Hollywood. They're focusing on the personal life of Neil Armstrong. They're focusing on the personal life of the Apollo 13 astronauts. People wanna know more than just the scientific component of NASA personnel. And that's what we're trying to save. Let's see, is that okay? Matthew, thank you. Yeah, he gave a lot of useful information uh, um, that, you know, I, no way, I, I tried to write a lot of it down, but there's no way. But the good news is we've re video recorded this and this will be on the, uh, the National Alumni League website probably in a week or two. So you can replay his presentation. And I have brochures and business cards if people would like to take them. Okay. Uh, Tell me when you want to stop recording. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, yeah, we can stop recording now. Thank you, everyone online. Uh, uh, oh, no, no, uh, don't, don't hang up yet. Still got a couple more things to go.